Last time we went into the concept of din or justice, mishpat. And what I really want to do is to go into that concept again today, but with respect to a specific objective. And our objective is to get some kind of grasp at what kind of determination was made with the Umus Ha'olam, with the nations of the world, the Goyim. And essentially, if we can understand something about the mechanism of how the Goyim were created in the first place. <laughs> but in order to do that, we have to have something of a better idea of the nature of justice or din itself. These words you really should remember, the word din or the word mishpat are essentially synonymous, but not exactly referring to justice or law. What we're going to do is to examine the uh, the deeds of a tzaddik and a rasha. Now, we can perforce only do this somewhat superficially. To do this in a very detailed level is very, very difficult. There are many, many rules here. But what I'm trying to do is to get some kind of scope, some kind of basic understanding of how the Rosham applies the leader or the attribute of justice. And it is in a very, very complicated situation. The reason is because the way God delivers justice changes from, from stage to stage. Depending on the stage of humanity and we are holding, the attribute of justice itself will change. This is a very, very critical thing. Why is that? I mean, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Justice is justice, why should it change? Because what it is is the following, and this turns on to the very critical ratio. We have said that in creating the entire physical world, there was a specific objective. That God created our physical universe in order to create the ability, the opportunity of removing the problem called non Sufa, so that the Nishama as a person then has the ability to create his actual reward or his actual status in Olam Haba. Now, in doing that, God employed God employed the mirror or the attribute of justice. And that essentially was his purpose. Along the way, the Buddhism decided that if you would simply apply the concept, the attribute of justice itself, the results would be catastrophic. Because you must remember that originally, the whole purpose of creation, period, the whole reason why God decided to suddenly make something other than himself, what's called the Zulafa, was to create another type of being who had the capacity to appreciate the goodness in which he wants to give. It was the inability of that neshama who would be the recipient of that tov to accept that goodness, gratis, or just like this, that God decided to give the neshama a choice conflict so that the neshama would go ahead and create its own reward. Hence, the entire existence had to change to accommodate this new concept called free will or called uh, justice where the neshama earns what it has on its own therefore if a neshama as a person earns it chooses in the direction of God and it earns what it's supposed to earn it gets what it itself created if it does not then it loses it so whereas initially God created the world with the intent to do to create goodness he modified that intent with the fact that the neshama must earn that goodness. That means there would be a rule based on justice. What you do is what you get. Exactly equivalent. If you earn something, you get it. If you don't earn it, you lose it. That is the strict application of meter to negative meter, measure for measure, measure, which is the concept of justice. Now, the virgin realized because he was able to look ahead 
and see what men would do. And he saw that in the future men would not be able to sustain that. They would sin. They would choose on the wrong path. They would go away from God and go towards themselves. So the bunch of knew that if he created the world on true justice, mankind eventually would have to be annihilated. So what the Vanisham then did was say, I will add another feature to creation, a new kind of Hanoga, which we have labeled Hanoga Tayyichud, the attribute of his unity, and essentially, in more simple terms, it refers to the Midasa Rachamim, mercy, so that God tempers justice with mercy, so that even though people sin, God sustains their existence and the existence of the world, and keeps it going, and gives them another chance. Now the Mida, or the attribute, the Koya, the power which does that, is the attribute called Rachamim. It has nothing to do with justice. The Mida of Din, Mida means the attribute, or the measure of Din, has nothing to do with Rachamim, mercy. Din knows no Rachamim. Din simply knows it gives you what you've earned. Rachamim is what says, let that person continue, even though he no longer has any real claim to existence because of his sins. What's very important to realize is that each Hanhoga, each Nida that comes before God has a specific objective and can only meet that objective. It cannot function outside of its bounds. Hence the Nida or the Hanhoga of Mishpat cannot do mercy. And the Hanhoga of mercy cannot do justice. Each one does what he can. Now, so therefore we see that our world is created with two meters or two anhogas. Another means way of conduct. God conducts this world or guides this world according to two criteria. The criteria of mishpat and the criteria of yichud or rachadam. Mercy. These are the two criteria. Now the question that you must ask is the relationship of these two Anogas or criteria what are they and do they always remain the same and that's the point they do not remain the same so that at the outset when God first created the world the world was run almost entirely on the meter of justice and there was a very very little bit of Rachman but as the world went on and man continued to sin then the midst of Rachamim became more necessary. So the meat of justice began to get smaller. And this has enormous ramifications in terms of what the Torah is, and it has more than that, enormous ramifications about who you are and what you become. Because as the meat of Mishpat shrinks, so do you. You become smaller and smaller as a person. You become less and less aware and your consciousness becomes greatly restricted. The more you have to come on to Rachamim, the smaller you become as a being. The meter of Rachamim and justice, Mishpat and Rachamim that were applied to other missions, were totally different than the meter of Mishpat and Rachamim that were applied after. They were different that the ratio of the two changed. The ratio of the two unholy changed. And, as I said, this has enormous ramifications. My description now of the attribute of justice is based on the way it works now. This is not the way it has always worked. Okay? So that's why it's important to realize this before I go into this. This is the way God mm-hmm. runs the world now, in 1986. And he's been running it this way for a long time. You see, the last awesome power change that was affected in terms of this, I mean, real way it was affected, was by the sin of the golden calf. That shifted the ratio enormously. There were probably a half a dozen shifts through history that you can literally identify the shift in the ratio between these two unhuggers, the way God conducts the world, more according to justice or more according to mercy. And the major shift that we are dealing with took place by the sin of the golden calf. And the man who was responsible for that shift was Moshe Rabbeinu. 
few people realize that when Moshe Rabbeinu sat there and argued with God about the sin of the golden calf, when the FDA committed him, and God said, let me destroy this entire nation and let me make a new nation for you, and Moshe Rabbeinu said, no, I refuse. Remember Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, your promise to them. What few people realize that what Moshe finally got through, and he was successful, is that he shifted the Hanhogas in the, in the creation itself. He literally twisted the thing so that when the time it came out, it was a whole different ratio. It was a ratio from who? Whose ratio did he shift? He shifted the ratio from Avram. When God revealed himself to Avram and told him the things that he did, especially in a place called the Brisbane of Son, or the Covenant of the Pieces, the Burnish essentially told Avram that the following will be the ratio of these two and others. It's another way to look at it. It's a strange way to look at it. That's all. Everything that you see in the Torah when Burnisham speaks to Tzadikim is nothing more than the ratio of these two and others. Except it doesn't look like that. But that's really the underlying dynamic of what's going on. The Bonisho is telling the Sadiq, I am shifting my ratios. And because I have shifted them, I have different expectations from the human race. And the last major shift was the shift from Moshe Rabbeinu. And there was just, there were minor shifts after that. But that shift was done after that. That's why, and the essence of that shift is in the day of Yom Kippur. Because Moshe succeeded on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is so great a day because Yom Kippur is an essential recognition of the shift. So that the Hanukkah Mishat diminished and Hanukkah Sayyichot went up. When the Bolshevim said to Moshe Rabbeinu, I want to destroy Kalisol and make a new Jewish nation from you, and since you are descended from Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, mm-hmm. you are, right. my promise is fulfilled. What the Bonisham was saying, therefore, is that I want to continue this effort called the Jewish people in a different context. But what he was saying is, I want to continue according to the original ratio in which I told to Avram, you see. And when Moshe said no, then I refused to tell you what the Bonisham said, and what he agreed to, he said, I will shift ratios. And we will get into that, what he did. What, what Moshe succeeded in doing was an incredible, incredible thing that had never been done since the first day of creation. Because Moshe, when he shifted that ratio, he shifted in a way which was not seen on the world since the time of, at all, ever. And he told the Bunisha what he did, essentially. And just to give the basic idea, what he really did was, and I'll just kind of block the main idea because what he did was but that the Jews when they left Egypt were ready for the time the messianic period I've said this many many times which means that when the Bonishim revealed to them the Torah the first time around that light that he revealed to them was the light of the Mashiach itself now that light is an extremely exalted light and that light enables you to do many many profound things not least which would give you the wisdom to understand why everything happens the way it does. And that is no small light. <laughs> <laughs> with that light, with that understanding, you will know everything why it happens to you in your life. That's the power of that, that light. So that light was a pure light. And when the Bonisham saw that Clyde himself didn't deserve it because of the ego, because of the golden calf, the Bonisham said, let me take back that light. You see, start all over from you, and if the nation that comes from you is worthy, I will again bring that light down. So Moshe Rabbeinu did not want to take any chances. Because if, if we could fail now, who's to say we can't fail again? You know? So what Moshe said was the following, no, I want to hold that light. I refuse to give it back. So Moshe held in his hand the light of the Mashiach. And he said, <coughs> But I will do that light, and he begged the Bonisham, is to let that light remain on the earth. But disguise it in an incredible darkness. You see, that's what he begged the Bonisham to do it. But let it remain here. And that rather having to retrieve that light for the first time again, the second time, to go back and take that light down again, he, what he did was convince the Bonisham that the task to change. 
rather than taking it down, what we'll do is simply uncover the darkness. You see what I'm saying? It was a whole different job. Mm-hmm. Because that light is here. So what happened when Moshe came down? He took the luchos, the tablet, and he broke it. And he threw it down to the ground. What he took was the light of Mashiach and buried it in the earth. You see? <laughs> because what the Bonicum said, give me back the tablets. I gave these tablets to you for Christ's law. They're not your tablets. You know what I mean? Give it me back. The world is not ready for this light. So Moshe convinced the Bonicum to hold on to it and he cracked the lucos and he threw it down. So the light was buried in the, into the world itself. You see, that's really what happened. But in order to do that, you know, how do you do that? He had to convince the Bonajom to shift ratios. Because only a shift in ratio will allow such a light. Only when another thing yichud, suddenly it becomes extremely powerful. And the mishvat goes down. Can such a thing be? So that action was literally a shift in the whole way God conducts the world. You see. So when the Mashiach comes... <coughs> Oh, now, when did Moshe Rehul take down that? When did he come down? He broke the, the Lucas when he first came down. And then he came down with the second tablet. What was the second tablet? The second tablet, the first tablet, are the light of the Mashiach. The second tablet is the light of the Mashiach buried in darkness. And the second tablet were written in that way. It was a different type of tablet. It already had that light buried in darkness. You see. And when did Moshe bring down the second tablet? On the tenth day of Tishrei. And the Bolshev said to him, As you have succeeded in convincing me to save this nation by transforming this light in a different way and shifting my Hanhogas, the ratio, the way I conduct the world, you see, let that day become a day forever to the Jews that they will always be able to come to me and beg me forgiveness and on that day the Sutton, the Yetzirah will not come up in front of the court because that is the day that I shifted the ratio and let that day be for Christ's will to the end of time that's why the tenth of Tishrei became Yom Kippur Kippur is the negation of Mishpat because as we said the Sutton cannot be Makatim on Yom Kippur the course of law of justice in the heavens are closed. Now that's the only day in the year when such a thing is, that such a thing does not occur. The courts of justice are always open, always, every day, God judges the world, except on Yom Kippur, when there is no court of justice at all. Mm-hmm. And because of that, whatever prayer you send up gets delivered. Now basically, because of what Moshe did, the Mashiach had a different job. If Moshe had not succeeded in what he did, then the Mashiach would be an individual that has to pull that light back down. You see. But since Moshe succeeds in what he does, the Mashiach has to pull the light up from the darkness. And not down from the Shemayim. Which means the whole concept of Mashiach shifted because of what Moshe did. But Moshe was extremely saddened by that. Why? Because Moshe was a Mashiach that had to see that light from darkness. And that's why when Moshe was in the last days on earth, God showed him all the future Jews to the end of time. And when he saw it, he saw a man called Rabbi Akiva, who was an incredible figure that would live maybe 1400 years later. And he saw Rabbi Akiva was an incredible individual. He saw Rabbi Akiva was teaching his students, and Rabbi Akiva was learning things from the letters of the Torah and the little crowns on the letters. And from the crowns on the letters, Rabbi Kiva was telling the students what it meant. So Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, he says, you have a man like this, and you choose me to give the Torah? That's what he said. So the Bonakim says, I will choose who I will choose. For one reason, you are, you know, you are who you are, and this man is who he is, and this Rabbi Kiva is who he is. So when Moshe saw that, for one minute, he got jealous. And Moshe was never jealous of anyone. How could he be? He was jealous of Rabbi Akiva. Why was he jealous of Rabbi Akiva? Because Rabbi Akiva was a Moshiach who reached the highest light. He reached the highest light above Moshe. 
and Moshe Rabbeinu failed to reach it for different reasons you see so when God said to Moshe Rabbeinu after the sin of the golden calf the Chedego go down you see he wasn't only referring to the fact that go down from this mountain he said go down from your exalted position you see but in going down Moshe saved the Kalisol that lived at that point in time the Jews that lived at that point in time and he condemned the light of the Mashiach to a whole different type of habitation and the, so that the path could be different for the ultimate Mashiach itself that is a short introduction let's get into the heart of the matter and what I want to point out is a very peculiar thing here we are looking here we are the Bezim Shemala at this point we are the heavenly court and or we are observers in the heavenly court can't uh, and we, are, we have been invited to sit in the heavenly court for a short period of time and uh, we are observing to some degree how justice is, is administered and so on and up comes an individual his name is Yaakov and he's in front of the bed in Shamala and what happens in the bed in Shamala? needless to say he's extremely frightened because in that bed in Shamala there are no games, number one. There's no way to bribe anyone, and nobody forgets anything. <laughs> so it's a real difficult situation. You know, every time you're in front of a court of law, you think, well, you know, maybe it's the way you say it that counts. It's style. You know, up there it's all substance. <laughs> There's nothing to do with style. So you're in real trouble if you have very little substance. So this man, Nato, is coming from the bed in Chamala, and now he's got to deal with the problem of his, all his deeds in his life. So what happens is, and I said last time, every time the man chooses to do a mitzvah, he creates, he literally creates a malach, or a spiritual force which represents the power of that mitzvah. And whenever he does a chet, he creates a malach or a spiritual power which represents the, the, the expression of that chet. And what it is, it's a very simple matter in judging this person, this person because you simply have to simply compare the array of all the malachim on one side and all the malachim on the other. Now what I've said is that judgment in the Shemayim, judgment in heaven, is not quantitative, it is qualitative. You see? Because two people could do the exact same mitzvahs, and yet they'll be totally different. Because it has a lot to do with where the people are holding, what they know, how difficult it is to do, how much mysterious nefesh shall sacrifice it takes to do a certain mitzvah, and so on. So it is essentially a qualitative pursuit. But, Basically, what the Bonisham does, what the Benson does up here, is that they evaluate the sum total of this man's deed. You see. And after they evaluate it, they kind of get a feel for the numbers. And what we're told, what the Ramosha Chaim Mutalo says, but it's far, it's much deeper than that, but on a somewhat simplistic level, we deal here in a certain aspect in terms of the majority and the minority. You know, we assess qualitatively and quantitatively the sum total of what this person has done and we divide it into a majority and a minority so that we look at the majority of his deeds and the minority of his deeds we see so what we have therefore in this present model while we're observing is two people one person Yaakov happens to be a Tzaddik and the other person Ruben I know he happens to be a Russia and these two people are coming in front of the court one after the other and what does it mean that one is a tzaddik and one is a rasha? Well, Yaakov here, when they assess the, the, the potency of his deeds, they see that something called 75%, let's say, of his deeds were mitzvahs, were good. And that 25% were bad, were chatoim. Now, like I say, these, these are qualitative assessments, not quantitative assessments, and I assume that everyone here understands what I mean by that. It's not, you want, you don't, I, I won't, I don't believe I have to say what that means. Qualitative in terms of the quality of the mitzvah, not the quantity. Because like I say, the same mitzvah could have a whole different weight. Now, Ruvay, who is a Rosha, has the exact reverse. 75% of the deeds are bad, and 25% are good. You see. Okay, now, what's the problem? It's a very, very serious problem. Because when you have only one mitzvah, it's a very simple thing to see what's going to happen. But when you have many mitzvahs, what's called a multifaceted world, then you have to take into account the ratios, or the, the, uh, the different uh, 
values here of the majority versus the minority, the world and the real. There is a very big problem, you see. What is that problem? It relates to what we said last week, and I will again repeat it this week. I have made a statement last week that justice is nothing more than a description of an existential state. That's all it is. What do I mean? When a person does a hate, do you remember what I said? When a person does a hate, what happens? Because of the fact that he is doing that sin through free will, that free will, we have said, comes from what's called the may iron, something from nothing. We have said, and I will not amplify, that the ability to do something freely means that there is no imposition from reality more on one side than another. You see, a person is confronted with a certain opportunity or a certain nisoyim to either do a mitzvah or not. And what happens is, the sides of reality that are coming in both directions have equal pressure, so that the fundamental choice of which direction he will go emanates from the self, his own being, not from any extra pressure from a certain side of reality, you see. It's coming totally from what he wants to do, which means that it is coming from a place which transcends existence. And that's what's important. Free will means that you have the ability to transcend existence. You have the ability to do something or to come up with some kind of direction that has nothing to do with the demands of reality. But rather you have the ability to come up with a certain type of decision that comes from within the inwardness of your very sense of self. And that transcends existence. That's why we use the exhaustive term that free will is a concept of yesh me'ayin. Yesh me'ayin means to create something from nothing. And only God can create something from nothing. But when it comes to will or direction, man can also create something from nothing. God can create something from nothing with respect to existence or reality. We, men, can create something from nothing with respect to will. Hence, the ability to choose is a divine gift. And it is a divine replication. What happens? What happens if a person chooses the wrong way? What we have said is that if he chooses the wrong way, that means that he chooses to become a false god. Because as we have said before, the ability to right and wrong, to do a mitzvah or chet, basically rides on what you want to think of yourself. If you want to think of yourself as important, important enough that you have a way of thinking and an independence beyond God, and you can do what you want because you carry a certain potency with you. There's a certain esteem or there's a certain type of significance that you have taken that says that you are in existence yourself and in some way you can at least command your own existence. If you do that, then you will create a pseudo-divine figure or a false divine figure yourself. Now the amazing thing is that you therefore will be creating a false ex- divine figure as you enter into the world of the divine, as you go into a world called Yeshua Ayan, as you transcend existence, you will go beyond existence to create a figure which cannot exist. Because it is not true that you are God or you have anything near like God. So basically, since that is not true, you will be attempting to create something which is non-existent by drawing or putting your hand, so to speak, into the well that transcends existence itself. The result is you will be setting up a contradiction in your own being that will force your entire being to self-destruct. That is the wage of sin. The wage of sin is self-destruction. Why? Because the very act of choosing is an act of existence. When you choose, you are saying who you are. As you choose, fundamentally you are telling existence who you are relative to existence. And if you make a false statement, you are telling existence something which cannot be. You therefore annihilate yourself. 
Free choice is an act of creativity. It is an awesomely powerful act because of the fact that it is free. If it were not free, it would have nowhere near the power. But since it is free, truly free, you have the power, so to speak, of, your, of a God with respect to your own will. And that has the power to create or destroy. Therefore, to do a mitzvah is to create yourself. It's to affirm your existence. It's to give your existence a new lease on life, <coughs> so to speak. So that your existence will be able to exist for all eternity. When God says, I will give men free will, and I will let them determine their own olam haba, God says, I will put eternity, or the ability to exist or not exist, in the hands of a person, himself, so that he literally will create his own existence. He will determine his own eternal state. And that's what it is. If you do a mitzvah, you have created an eternal state of existence. If you do a chayt, you have created an eternal state of non-existence. In both cases, it is an existential state. And that's what it is. You see. So, again, very simply, in in, in, in summarizing statements, the act of free will is an act of creation. The act of free will is a divine act with respect to choosing directing direction. And the act of free will has the ability, because it is a statement of your existence, to determine whether or not you will survive or not. The consequence of free will is a consequence of creation. The consequence of free will is a statement of existence itself. Your existence. So that depending on what you do, so you become. That means that true justice, the court of justice, is a court of existence. When the Shemayim, when the heavenly court wants to look at you and they want to determine what's going to happen to you, essentially what they want to do is to know what kind of existence do we have in front of us. That's what it is. It is an observation of what has been created. It's not some arbitrary thing of what they decide to do. Well, we're going to be good to him. We're going to give one of our ball. Or we're going to punish him. As I told you, the God does not reward, and God does not punish. God is not your parent, you see. He is not. Although the Torah refers to him as an of, that is with respect to the concept of mercy. As far as justice is concerned, God is not a father. God is a creator, and that's it. God transcends that. And as far as the Mises Haddin is concerned, as far as the power of your free will, the Buddha simply says, I give you the power to create. I have the power to create, I give you the power to create in your domain. But in your domain, you have literally the power to create, and I will not interfere. I will know what you're going to do, and I will know what you will do in advance. But my knowledge of that does not interfere with your ability. The court of justice simply looks and sees what happens to your existence. And that's it. So now we have a problem. We have a big problem. Because this topic that comes up in front of the Shemayim. 75% of the deeds are good and 25% of the deeds are bad. So then, what's the nature of the existence? You see, what? If we say that since the majority of the deeds were good, and so the majority of the deeds should determine what he is, you see, fine. So then we see that he has created in himself the status of eternal being. Fine. But what about 25% of Hatoyim? This 25% represents an aspect of annihilation. How do you reconcile these two? How is this guy going into an eternal place called Olam Abba? Olam Abba has nothing to do with mercy. In Olam Abba, they don't know anything about mercy up there. You didn't know Hanogah say Yichot in Olam Abba. There are no ratios. Up there there's only one Hanogah called Hanogah Samishva. And that's it. So in Olam Abba, you've got to be, whatever it is, you've got to be a homogeneous being. Your existence must be uniform. Either you exist or you don't exist. And that's all there is to it. You can't exist there with some chatoyim on your back. Yeah, you can't, that's not possible. You can't exist partially and non-exist partially. That's, that's impossible. You see what I'm saying? So therefore, the attribute of justice has big problems with this kind of thing. 
as long as man has one mitzvah, there's no problem. Because that one mitzvah will determine his fate. But if man has more than one mitzvah, there are big problems. And it's the same thing with a Russia. Turn it around. If a Russia, most of his deeds, what? Are bad. Chatoim means that he's rebelled against God. And essentially he's been occupied in creating non-existence. For a good many years. So therefore this man has earned an existential status called non-existence. But wait, he's also done some good deeds. You see. So the preponderance of his existence is not is not is non existent, or he should go out of existence, but then there's this small piece of him that try to hold him on to existence, you see. You know, this should be this Russia should be floating into a world of zero and there's certain things that are holding him back to the world of plus, you see. And the topic, you see, should be going to a world of existence, of true existence, but there's something trying to take them into non existence. You see what I'm saying? That is not a condition of Olam Abba. So there's a big problem in terms of the what? In terms of the dispensation of bin in that world. How do we get around that? Well, that's an interesting thing. And what we do, is we see an amazing thing, is that what happens is, in order for Olam Abba to be a state of uniform existence, and not confusing states, what happens is, is that there is a major, major shift. A major shift. What is that? What God did was intervene, interfere, into the very laws of existence itself. That's what he did. What do I mean? It is obvious that the mitzvah did. Just mitzvahs and chatoim must be statements about your existence. That's obviously what it is. That has to do with the power of free will. But what the Buddha said was, is the following, is that not all of your deeds will be a statement about your own existence. Not all of it. Except that it says the following. Rather, what the Buddhism said was that the majority will describe your existence. So that if you, the majority of your deeds, were either good or bad, that would be a statement about your eternal existence. If you were being good, you, essentially you would have acquired true existence. If you will have been bad for the majority of these, a Russia, you will have acquired true non-existence and you must be annihilated. What about the minority of your deeds? What the Buddhism said was the following, is that the minority of your deeds, you see, would not, will not be treated as existential states that are statements about your existence. Rather, they will be treated as external aspects of your neshamah. So that, in the tzaddik, what it is, is the 75% of mitzvahs will resurrect your neshama and give it existence. The 25% will not be a statement attempting to undermine that reinforcement or strength in the neshama. Rather, what the Bodhisham said was, I will simply add that to you externally to your neshama. Like an outside agent hanging on to you like a parasite. <laughs> Rather than letting your deeds become part of you, be a reflection of you in terms of who you are, I will make the minority of your deeds simply actions or consequences that are simply are added to you, meaning that they have some ability to harm you or help you, but as something which is attached to you, not something which is you. You see what I'm saying? It's somewhat subtle. The 75% of the good deeds say that you have a real, that your neshama or the existence of your neshama is now alive. The 75% of the bad deeds in Russia say that your neshama must be annihilated. 
It's a description of the Neshama. The 25 steps in both cases are simply consequences which are not statements of what you will be in terms of your eternal life, but they're statements in terms of how well you can function, period, or how well you can feel, you see. They're not statements about your eternal being. They're simply statements about what you are doing now, or how you will be able to survive now, so that a tzaddik who has 75% good deeds, you see, has earned eternity. And 25% of bad deeds simply do not interfere with his eternity, but they make him feel miserable. Now. Now. You see what I'm saying? It's like... It's a difference, for example, of entering into a person's genes and altering them so that you alter the very person or simply introducing a parasite into a system, a system and making them miserable. It's a difference between a birth defect, you see, and a, simply, a simple infection. What's a birth defect? A birth defect is really affects the being of the person. Totally, you see. For example, a mongoloid child is a birth defect. But the child, the entire being is different because of the genetic malformation. But, essentially, an infection, or simply bacterial infection, doesn't affect the very nature of the person. It simply retards or slows down his ability to function, you see. It makes his life miserable. But it doesn't really define his nature. It simply defines his functioning, how well he can function. So what the Bhagavan said was that the majority of your mitum will define your nature. And the minority will simply be an indication of how well you'll be able to function. That's all. What's the difference between that? Well, you can't get rid of a birth defect. Because once your nature has been changed, you can't do anything about it. But you can get rid of something which is making you feel uncomfortable. Can't you? And that's what happens. What happens is the following. Is that a tzaddik, or person whose most of his deeds are good, has determined what his nature will be, what his existence will be in Olam Abba. But his 25% evil deeds, you see, have to be what? Cleared up. They have to be removed. And they can be removed because they're not considered part of his nature. Since this 25% of Chatoim are not part of the person's nature, there's simply something which is added to the person, like some kind of sickness or disease. God can simply give you a drug to take care of the disease, and that's the end of it. And the disease disappears and leaves you completely with whatever your nature is. You see what I'm saying? So therefore, what the Buddhism does to a person like this, is that he makes his life difficult. A tzaddik who lives in this world, whose most of his deeds are good, and some of them are not, what the Buddhism does is simply gives them different types of misfortunes. And as he goes through life with different kinds of misfortunes, he gets sick, you see, or he becomes poor, or he loses a job, whatever the situation is. He just finds it hard to deal with things and so on, he has an emotional conflict, whatever the situation is. This thirst, or agonies that come on a person, right, all wash away this 25%. They wash it away. It is the cure, or it is the medicine for the disease. But the disease is not part of the person, you see. It's simply connected to him, and therefore to be removed. It is the same thing with a Russia. It is the same thing with a Russia. What it is, is since in a Russia, his life is such that most of his deeds are bad, then God says your nature has already been determined. You have determined that your inner essence will be non-existent. So what about the good deeds? So they become added to the person. Like a disease. Good deeds, or the good consequences, are like a disease to him. You see, so what the Bhagavad does, he gets rid of the good, good parts, the good events of the loss of life. How? He gives him tremendous success. He lets him enjoy the fruits of his good deeds. And as he enjoys the fruits of the good deeds, he loses the reward that should go from those good deeds. You see what I'm saying? You see, but this is very unusual. Because what God is doing is something which is really awkward, it's deviant. 
Because the punishment does not reward or punish these. These or actions of your free will are consequences and they determine your nature or your existence. You see. That's what it is. They are statements about who you are or what you become. But for the first time we see that only part of your deeds describe your nature as far as Ulama Bar is concerned, whether you will exist or not. And the minority, you see, have to say nothing about your nature, but simply demand to be rewarded or punished, as they are in themselves. So God punishes you by bringing you service, and in that way He removes or purifies you. The word in Hebrew is Seirah. Seirah means purification. So God purifies you by removing the bad consequences of your behavior. You see, by giving you suffering. And as you suffer, the bad consequences of your, of your, of your behavior simply hang on to your neshama. You see, like some kind of a parasite or a leech that has to go off. So we see a very critical thing. We see that when you do certain mitzvahs, they can have two different types of effects, depending if they are the majority or not. Your deeds will have two different types of effects. Your deeds will either determine what your existential nature will be for eternity, or they will be added to you like a leech. You see. <coughs> The majority of those deeds those, uh, those these will create your existence in your nature. The minority will be added to you from the outside, and the Buddha will simply get rid of whatever is added to you by simply either reward or punishing you. If he wants to get rid of the minority of your bad deeds, he will punish you and purify you so that all that remains is existence. If you are a Russia, then what the Buddha will do is reward your good deeds. And once he rewards your good deeds, those good deeds will disappear, you see, because they will have no more claim to any reward. And once he does that, he will purify you, and you will therefore be only what your nature will become non-existent. That's the essence. The virtue wants to reduce you to your nature, whatever it is. If your nature is existence, he wants to purify you, so that all you have is existence. If your nature is non-existence, then he wants to purify you, so all you have is non-existence. So what he has to do is remove those deeds, you see, which interfere with what you become and eliminate them. But he eliminates them by making the effects of those deeds not part of your nature, but something added to it so that he can deal with it separately and remove it. Now this ability to take something you've done, a mitzvah that you've done, and take it out of a zone of creativity is a very novel one. What the Bonishim does in the minority cases is that he eliminates or he removes the effect of these deeds to be a statement of your nature. You see. So they simply become added to you with some kind of claim. But not a claim in terms of who you will be or what your existence will be about. Simply a claim to be rewarded or punished. One way or the other. That's all. So with respect to these deeds, God is a creator and you are a creator. With respect to these, God is like a father. One way or another, he will reward or punish you, in that sense. So, these are criteria that you will see. If you see a person, for example, who is a very bad person, an evil person, and you see that he has tremendous prosperity, you will begin to understand what's going on. You know, there's, a very, there's, a, there's an old story that I once read of ancient uh, uh, power of Marshall, really. The ancient story was his farm, and what it was is that the, the horse was having a conversation with the cow, you see, and the horse was complaining to the cow, he doesn't understand. The pig, every day, the farmer takes a while, I won't use the pig, but the, 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 but the farmer every day, well, uh, takes his uh, pig out, and what he does is he gives him all the food that he wants to eat. Mm -hmm. Let him roll and more, do whatever he wants, and he lives the life of an incredible life, you see, an incredible life. And why he has to sit there and he just gets his hair, what else do He has to go out and he has to work and he has to do difficult things. And this pig, you see, seems to have a life of, of complete simcha, whatever he wants. You see, so the cow says to him, wait, wait. Wait a little while in the future. Until one day, the horse sees that what? That the farmer takes the pig to the market. 
to be slaughtered and so on. And then the horse realizes, wait a minute, the reason why they're getting fed so much is because they were being fed so that eventually they can serve somebody else's food, you see. So in other words, what it is, is this kind of thing, if you, if you see a Russia, you see a person who's basically bad, and you see he's very much clear, or he's very prosperous, you may say, what's all this prosperity about? This prosperity is so that the Russia eats up all the good deeds that he has done in this life, so that when it comes time for an eternal determination, he has nothing left. And therefore, he goes into the world of purity, into the world of non-existence, which is essentially what he's earned. If you see a person who is essentially a very good person, a, let's say a religious person, or a very good person that suffers a great deal, you will know that God brings on the suffering, because the religion wants to make sure that this person will remain pure with respect to existence. So the religion wants to remove all the bad deeds that he's done, and not let them become part of his nature, you see. But he wants to move them now. What shifted this, what shifted Din to take a different format, you see, what shifted the fact, normally Din or Mishpat only looks at deeds in an existential form. It sees your deeds that come from free will as a way of determining your nature. But what happened was that Hamas HaYichot, as it got greater in its ratio, affected the way Mishpat operates. So that Mishpat now would operate in a way where it would allow your deeds not to determine who you are, but rather how comfortable you are, you see. And the Bodhisattva will deal with you in a different way. He still deals with you according to justice, but it's a different way. And the Dhamma is a Yichon that introduces this kind of thing. A person, you see this is the thing, a person who has become very rich has a lot to worry about. <laughs> It sounds interesting, and it's really true, you see. We all say, well, you know, like, why can't God make me rich? You know, or like, it would be incredible, and we all work for this. But you don't realize that in many cases, if God would allow you to become rich, it would be incredibly detrimental. That there are many people that the Bodhisattva will not allow to be rich, because that wealth would then begin to eat up a great deal of what they should have. The Bodhisattva keeps them poor, you see. Because you have to remember, there are two criteria here. You can either, and the justice, the real justice relates to you in two ways. It relates to you in terms of your existence, what you will be for eternity, and how comfortable you will be in this world. You see. And to some extent, there are inverse ratios as well. You see. That doesn't mean you cannot be fabulously wealthy and not be a tzaddik. I didn't say that. But you have to be very, very careful. You see. Because what happens is that suddenly you see your luck turn up. You see, and suddenly, you see that everything is on your way. You have to start getting somewhat nervous. <laughs> Why? Because there's another factor here as well, and it's important to realize. God also rewards Sadiqam, not only Rishoyim. He not only gives Rishoyim prosperity, you see, but He rewards also Sadiqam. But there's another question here, and why this is is not clear. The Buddhism looks into you, and he sees certain things, and essentially, what the Buddhism does is the very thing. He will look into you, and he really sees how hard you're trying. Only the Buddhism can do that. It's only, you can't even do it yourself. God can look into the essence of yourself, and he can see what kind of person you really are. And again, this is an ability to look into what transcends reality. Because the self transcends reality. So God looks into the self and God knows what kind of person you are. He can see whether or not you're really good at the core or if you've got some, you have some rottenness at the core. You see. So what the Buddhism will do sometimes is that even though you have many mitzvahs, what the Buddhism will do is he simply says, he sees that you've done a lot of mitzvahs. But there's something about you that's not really very nice. And the Buddhism will say in his own way, I don't like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny. And what the Buddhism will then do is begin to reward you in this world. Why? So he doesn't have to give you in the next world. Even though, because of the mitzvahs, you will have attained eternal existence, but the Buddhism does not want to give you such a big 
eternal reward. He doesn't want you to be in a high place in Allah Mahabha. Even though you've already acquired that position, he wants to confiscate some of that. So he would prefer to pay you off here. So what he does was, he takes the mitzvahs that you've done and removes it from the existential sphere. So it doesn't influence what you will be. You see, separates it and he allows it then to determine how comfortable you become here. You see what I'm saying? He shifts it from that sphere. So he does it with the quality of mitzvahs such that on his own. Why he does that is a very mysterious thing. But that's the amazing thing about it. The Bonisha will take people who are, will look like a tzaddikim and pay them off over here. Because he's not crazy about these people. <laughs> you see. And then there are people who are not really that good. You see. And what it is, is these people should really have less in Olam Haba, but the Bonisha wants to increase it. So he really gives them a hard time. You see. Because he wants to build them up. Now, if you ask, well, what determines this thing? What determines that? That's, it's very, very difficult to know that, you see. The Moshe Khamsara mentions it in, in the safe of Deir Hashem, and he does not really clarify the determination, really. But it seems to be, and what it seems to be, is it, it has to do with the way the Moshe looks at you. And it has to do with what the kind of person you really are, you see. It, it, it's a funny thing, it's, it's, just, it's a funny way of thinking, because there is something called a rotten person that has nothing to do. And they think. There is something called a lot of person that has nothing to do with his environment or his personality or the pressures of reality. He just rotten to the core. Now you might say, what do you mean he's rotten to the core? Maybe he had a bad life. You see. He had a bad background, you know. What is the story where he's frustrated? What do you mean he's rotten to the core? But such a lotion is true. Such language is true. Why? Because since everything, basically what you do, when you have to do with free will, comes from your core. Basically, a Russia makes himself. Who makes a Russia? A Russia is making himself. God doesn't tell a person to be a Russia. So, in some way, there's something in that person's essence that's choosing, that wants to be rotten. So, it's got a rotten core. But it's a real rotten core that transcends existence. You see? Now, there are cases where people have rotten cores, but they do a lot of mistress in certain ways. Either because they fall into it, or they have opportunities, whatever have you. But there's something about them that the Virgin does not want to put at the highest madregas or levels of Olam HaBa. So therefore he begins to pay you off over here. Over here, even though you really have earned eternal existence. So what he does is confiscate. See, that's amazing. He literally is the fear with might and favor with mitzvahs that you've done. In the sense that these mitzvahs should be a statement of your existence. And he disallows it. And he simply makes these mitzvahs a statement of how comfortable you will be in this life. So you, you, therefore you have to be, you have to be worried. If a person becomes very, very much liach, you have to really sit down and begin to think, hey, what's happening here? If you think that suddenly you're successful because you are suddenly successful, because suddenly, hey, wait a minute, I just lost into a great opportunity, or I'm really smart, or I know how to become rich, you are an absolute fool. You see? Because you will be courting terrible, terrible consequences, because then you will not examine What's going on? Most of you think that if you become poor or bad things happen, you should examine it. When do we examine our deeds? When things are not going for us. But I tell you, you should examine deeds when things go for you. Just as much as when they're not going. Because there are two sides to this coin. And they're doing it for a reason. You're not becoming wealthy on your own. No way. There is no way you don't have, there is no way you can only control your will. You have no control of existence. So suddenly you come into hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is not from you. The Bodhisattva has decided to do this for you. And you have to really sit down and really begin to think about this. You see. Do you know he's more than 51%? And I will go into this, not now, but later on. There is another class of events that happen to you that are completely outside of the sphere. What it is, is you sometimes can be punished, period for nothing that you've done on your own and severely punished even though there is that one thing that you have done to deserve it now, what does that mean? how, how is that possible? well, first of all, not everyone can be punished that way in order to be dealt with that way you have to be a very, very big topic why? 
because what it is is in order for the Borishalam to preserve the world and continue it in existence there was a certain contract that he makes with Tzadikim the greatest Tzadikim and that is is that in order for the world to survive what the Borishalam says is you will have to bear to some extent the difficulty of the thirst of other people and other Jews you see that doesn't mean that these other people get away with anything Hat to Shalom there is no such thing as getting away with anything what it says is well there's a, a famous story where the, uh, this man in the time of the Zunda Dawn this man became a convert he became a Christian and uh, one day he went out on the street and he took a, an apple and he started eating it so the Zunda Dawn approached him and says you didn't make a bracha so he says, what do you make a bracha? I'm a convert, I'm, I'm Catholic. What do I have to make a bracha for? So he says, I want to know, not only will you be punished for all the other things you will give up, the fact that you became a convert, but you will be punished because you didn't make a bracha on that apple. Mm-hmm. Meaning that the bonus, there's no such thing, the bonus does not forget anything. You can't get away with an isolated thing. Every deed you do, as a Jew, is always remembered, no matter what you call yourself. You see? So justice is extremely exact. But, what it is, is that in order to preserve the world and to keep it going, the Bonajam has initiated a specific contract with very, very great tzaddikim, so that they bear some of the turbulence and the troubles of Kalisol. And as they do it, what happens is, is that the Sutton or the Cuban angel lets up on the Jews. You see? And by letting up on the Jews, he does not demand the annihilation of the world. The big problem that we have is that what happens if most of the Jews are sinners and really bad sinners, you see? That's a very, very big problem. Because you're not dealing with justice on an individual level, you're dealing with it on a collective level. So the Sultan not only runs up to God and kindness or complains in front of God about this Jew and that Jew, the Sultan runs up, up, runs up to God and says, all Jews, what are you doing with this nation? They're worthless, you see. And how do we know that something has the ability to do that? How do we know that something has the ability to collectively undermine an entire nation? That's what happened to the Goyim. They were collectively undermined so that the Shroshim were totally changed. But even better, we see that something has the ability to go up to God and undermine the entire human race. How do we know that? The marble by Noach. What do you think the Sutton was doing? The Sutton went to the Bonnet and says, Hey, wait! Man does not deserve existence anymore. All of them. All mankind. And in that case, he had the power because of the ratio of Mishpat to to sustain his judgment. And all men were wiped out except for Neuch. That power is no longer his. But he has the ability to draw what's called a collective accusation. And it is this collective or na- accusation that worries God greatly. Because what it is, he's not dealing with individuals. He's dealing with the existence of all Jews. So what he does is, he has established a separate contract with Tzadikim to bear the brunt of that collective accusation. And as they bear that brunt, then the collective accusation goes down and the Sultan simply goes ahead and does his individual accusations. But the Jews are allowed to survive. Now you may say, well that sounds interesting, so you see that the Jews are getting a benefit. But what's the benefit to him? Well, obviously, since he's in that role, you see, and he has suffered in vain, so to speak, he is among the highest of the positions in Olam Haba. Because what happens is, God says, and when he comes to Olam Haba, this Tzaddik says, I have taken on this suffering to allow the continuation of the Jewish people collectively, even though individually they still have to retain their own individual justices, and therefore I am worthy, I have borne a tremendous amount of suffering for a collective thing. So my reward should be enormous, because the survival of the Jewish nation was part and parcel of my difficulty. So I have the reward to exact an incredible reward for this. And he does. So these tzaddikim are at the forefront of Olam Haba. But God chooses only certain tzaddikim to do it. You could have tzaddikim who are incredibly big, and he will not do it to them. They are not zochah to this kind of pasha. Because, see, God looks in them and he sees that they really don't want it. 
In other words, if you would go over them and say, are you willing to, to bear this kind of thing to allow the world to continue? They would say, no, I don't want it. It's enough for me to bear my own destruction. So God leaves them alone. And he goes to certain Sadiqim and he offers it to them. And these Sadiqim, of course, have a whole different thing. Now, the Sadiq, who is the greatest example of this concept, and this concept we call, the word suffering in Hebrew is the word Yesurim. The word Yesurim means suffering. This kind of suffering is called Yesurim Shel Ava. Or tribulations that come out of love. Well, it's both, in both cases. But if you assume out of love, it is the love of God for Christ yourself, for the Jews, to the continuation of the creation, you see. But in order for Sadiq to be on that level, he has to be enormously, enormously high. Now, the one Sadiq who exemplifies this to the highest degree of all is the Mashiach. And that's his basic nature. The Mashiach is the one who bears the load enormously. The more casual sins, the bigger the load he bears. So that when it comes to the end of time when he's about to appear, the load that he carries is so enormous that he's totally disfigured. And if you would see him right in front of you, you would not recognize him. Even though that is the person who has the light of the Mashiach in him. You see what I just said? Because he reflects the condition of the collective aspect of Kali We will get into that to a lot much larger extent later on. But it is a kind of Kali Sol Shalava. So that when you point out to me about different Sadiq of biblical times, Many of those tzaddikim in the biblical times were tzaddikim who were in this category so that their judgment had nothing to do with themselves. They were simply there to serve as a vessel to allow the continuity of existence. Now I have to be very careful here. No tzaddik can absolve the Jews from justice. This is a Christian concept. That's when there's a clear difference. The concept that Jesus absolved mankind from their sins is an absolutely anti-Jewish one. No one can absolve anything from the principle of justice. You see. <laughs> but what a subject can do is delay that justice and temporarily suspend the collective judgment on all of creation so that it continues to go on. So that at the end of time, on the great day of judgment, the entire world is then judged fully, without any negative repercussions. It is nothing more than a delaying thing, that's all. It's simply the continuity or the survival of the world. That's why these Tzadikim suffer. They do not absolve anyone from the smallest iota of a chet that he has done. That is total absurdity, totally against the very concept of justice, and in total contradiction to that concept of free will. You have free will? You've done what you've done. There's no one who can absolve that. No one. Because nobody can interfere with your ability in being God with respect to your free will. No topic. That's your gift. And no one can interfere with it. Therefore, you in the end must be responsible for what you've done. No one else. Nobody's going to get there and take the beating for you. You see. Not forever. God looks at your deeds first to answer the question who you are what is your eternal nature what is the eternal nature that you will have created that is the first question that God looks at the second question is what is interfering with this eternal nature whatever it is if your eternal nature is continuity of existence is eternity itself then he looks at the bad deeds that are interfering with that if your eternal nature is non-existent, then you will look at the good deeds which are interfering with that. 
and he would take those deeds, isolate them from affecting your nature itself, and deal with them separately as appendages to your nature, and eradicate them in one way or another by rewarding or punishing you. You see, but first what he does, he looks at this, this in the second case, he looks at those deeds which are interfering with what your eternal nature are. So that's why I tell you that your deeds have the capacity to define two aspects of you. What your eternal nature is, number one, and what interference there will be with that eternal nature. So that the function of this world is therefore two things. And this is very, very important to understand. And it is because of the fact that our world as we know it has two specific functions that makes life so confusing. This world serves as a place of trial where God creates the opportunity for free will. But this world also serves as a place of failure, purification. Do you see what I'm saying? One has nothing to do with the other. If this world was only a place that had to do with free will, life would be totally different for everyone. It would be. Because then everything that happens in this world is simply designed to see how you will exercise your free will. You see, that's all. And whether a person became rich or poor, or all these things would always be part and parcel of that test, that test position. But the problem is, is that this world also serves as a second function called seva or purification. Meaning that God uses this world to remove you see, consequences of your behavior that will interfere with your eternal nature. So God uses this world to reward and to punish. Now that's an unusual thing, because the, the essential function of this world is not to reward or punish. This world, Omar there was created to provide an opportunity for Bechira, for free will, and that's it. God has no intention to use this world to punish or reward. That's not what it is. Reward and punishment are statements of existence which have to do with Olam Bar. You see, either all my book or not all my book or non-existence. That's where it all happens. It should never happen here. But since we've got to deal with situations where there are multiple deeds, and you've got to deal with a what's called a purification process, this world then becomes also a place to purify a person so that whatever his eternal nature is will be manifest without problems. You see, that's why we refer to this world having the function to establish your eternal nature, and to achieve the homeostasis of justice. To allow justice to be pure in the next world, in whatever direction it is. It is a purification process. Now you may say, but well, what's the difference to me? Because there's a very big difference. Those, de- those events which occur in your life that relate to justice, that relate to free will, are events which will allow you to input freely. They allow you to have what's called a zone of creativity. You can input into these events with free will. Those events which do not relate to that, but relate to the process called sailor or purification, have no free will attached to them. God rewards or punishes you. And it's irrelevant what you feel or what you want to say. If you are a Russia, you will become prosperous whether you like it or not. (laughs) You will be prosperous, prosperous if you are an absolute jerk. <laughs> if you can't make the slightest business decision, you will be a multimillionaire. <laughs> you see. If you are an individual who wants to sell certain goods, and the cost of those goods is what? Is ten dollars a pound. If you decide to make a profit and sell it at nine dollars a pound, you will still be a millionaire. I don't know if you caught that. <laughs> <laughs> you see, if if your business judgment is so stupid <laughs> that you will charge $9 a pound to make a profit on something that your cost was $10 a pound, you will still be a millionaire. Now, how that's possible is an incredible thing, but that's because that's what it is, you know? You know, it's an amazing thing, you know, about, uh, just as an application, it's an amazing thing about America. I mean, the, the illusion of, of America. You know, America excel, excel, it prides itself on the concept of management science. 
You know, like if you want to be a real great corporate executive and you want to be a good thing, what you do, you can go to these schools and learn the principles of management and, and, and supervision and financial management, this whole business zone. As if in some way you can learn how to become successful. And that's an incredible illusion, you see. It's, a, it's an incredible illusion. Because the truth of the matter is, when you really look into many, many corporations, you see, when you look into the workings of many corporations, you see many fools at the head of these businesses, literally, who really cannot make sound decisions, and they decide based on emotions, or based on everything else but what's going on out there, and yet they succeed, you see. Like even, for example, it's an amazing thing in World War, in World War II, when the Allies against the Nazis, it's an amazing thing that in the Allies themselves, there were many cases where generals fought among themselves for political, for power. Who would make the right decision? You know, I want to get the credit for it. I want to get the credit for it. And therefore, you would think if a war would be won this way, it would be catastrophic to want, want a war on personal reasons. Yet, the Allies had to win. You see. Because that's what it is. The clowning can go on, and you can be a clown as much as you want. It is God who will determine the ultimate outcome of it, no matter what you do, you see. So you will be successful if you are called a fool, or you will be successful if you are really a brilliant fellow. If the position has to do with seraph. Seraph, or purification, is beyond the human endeavor process. And that's what it is. God will make rich those who you make rich, and poor, impoverished those who you impoverish. You can run around and jog all your life, you see, and you can eat the best foods, and you can be nutritionally the most sound and perfect person, and when God decides, you will still die of a heart attack at 45, and that's it. You can be a person who smokes like a fat, smokes three packs a day, you see, who eats nothing but beef, <laughs> sauteed in oil <laughs> or cooked in oil whatever you want you see and you could do what you want eat what you want you can be a totally disregard your health and you will live to 95 <laughs> now I'm not saying you should do that because there's something called seicha you know obviously but what I'm saying to you that there are many aspects of a life which are not in your hands and these are illusions these are true illusions. And you know when you find out the illusions? You find out the illusions suddenly when it just didn't go your way. Everything was going your way and suddenly it just didn't go your way. And you say, why? I was doing everything perfectly. Everything right. And just as I near the end, it flopped. Because it was all an illusion. That's really such a word. And God simply allows you to go on with the illusion. In that way. Yeah. We will conclude on this note. It would make sense, and I will leave with a very strange idea, a very strange idea, and I'd like to have your attention because it's going to be an idea you're going to ponder about. Right before the Mashiach comes, obviously the process of Tzeros must end. Right? Because when the Mashiach comes, the Anhogas, the way God runs the world, will shift again. The ratios again will shift enormously. Enormously. Therefore, we would think, interestingly enough, that right before the Mashiach comes, as mankind gets close and close to the end, that the purification process of reward and punishment has to become more and more intense, really. So that it is conceivable that for the end of time, there would have to exist a nation of some sort who would be so prosperous and successful, and living life in that nation would be so, well, relatively tranquil and so pleasant as to be the greatest type of lifestyle that has ever been known. Because the payoff has to work itself up. I call it the grand payoff. That's what it is. There are a lot of Nishamas floating out around out there. That the payoff demands, it demands a tremendous payoff. Now, here. That in some way has to be accumulated in one spot so that if God given this end and total payoff, right? It would be logical. Yes, that payoff is called America. <laughs> <laughs>